Thank you for joining us at lunchtime today. I'm Nathan Ryan, Chair of the Future Forum Board. On behalf of the Future Forum, thank you for joining us for a conversation on criminal justice and policing. Last month, the Greater Austin Crime Commission released a study recommending that Austin hire over 100 more police officers. In 2021, the number of homicides in Austin increased at an alarming rate. On September 1st, 2021, a new Texas law went into effect punishing cities that cut police budgets. And then last November, Austin voters rejected a proposal that would have required there to be at least two police officers for every 1,000 residents in Austin. What does all this mean for criminal justice in Texas and Austin specifically? We're gonna take a look at that today with some expert panelists. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, and national topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. This year, the LBJ Future Forum is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and we hope you'll join us for more programs like today's. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors, including the Downtown Austin Alliance and Carbach Brewing. I also wanna thank Sarah McCracken at the LBJ Foundation staff and the LBJ Foundation staff, as well as Kim Williams and Michael Henderson from the LBJ Future Forum board for all their hard work on this panel. There will be an opportunity to answer your questions at the end. You're able to type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the conversation, and we will address as many as we can. Uh, one, quick, one quick programming note before I turn it over to our moderator. Um, unfortunately, Mimi Marziani from Texas Civil Rights Project came down with a cold and she's unable to join us today. We hope you get well soon, Mimi. And now I'll turn it over to our moder moderator, Tony Plahetsky, investigative reporter uh, at the Austin American Statesman and KVU to lead our discussion. Take it away, Tony. Thank you, Nathan and Sarah and the foundation for not only inviting me to do this today, but also hoping, uh, hosting a very important conversation in our community that really has been unfolding in some aspects over the past couple of years, but really as someone who's lived here for, for two decades now, um, some of these issues go back uh, obviously in, in the history of Austin. We are now um, at a pivotal moment uh, in the minds of many people in our community to keep this conversation going and to uh, try to achieve what, what the topic of today's session is, which is to really try to uh, reach a consensus on some of these really polarizing issues in our community. I wanna take just a moment to uh, introduce our all-star panel, a panel of experts who really have been thought leaders um, in some of the topics that we're going to be diving into today. I wanna to start with you, Chris Harris, uh, Policy Director uh, here in Austin for the Austin Justice Coalition. And what I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to do is take just about 60 to 90 seconds to tell us who you are and also what your goals are for today's conversation. So Chris, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you so much, Tony. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you in, in this panel. Um, so, yes, I'm the policy director at the Austin Justice Co Coalition. I've been involved in organizing and advocacy around criminal justice issues for the, for the last really six years in earnest. And, um, you know, really my priorities around the, this conversation today are um, really to, to get at what public safety really means uh, and to, to, to hopefully come to some mutual understanding of that. Because, uh, you know, really from our perspective, um, if we're talking about public safety, what we're really talking about is the preservation of life and preventing the preventable harm, disability, and death in our communities. And when we look at it through this broader lens, what we really see is that um, our investments don't go towards preventing the things that are causing the most harm, uh, disability, and preventable deaths in our community, uh, because those things are overwhelmingly public health related issues. And, and public health receives a small fraction of what we spend in any community uh, on public safety. Um, and, and, and in fact, the opportunity costs that come with focusing so much of our dollars on a specific type of uh, still horrific harm and, and death that occurs in our community from interpersonal violence um, has are so great uh, that they actually cause more harm in our community by doing so. And so 
I really want to have a, a broader conversation to, to ensure that when we talk about public safety, we're really talking about all the ways in, in, in which our community members uh, face the potential for harm, disability, or, or death, and, and how we can work best uh, with our public dollars to, to prevent those where possible. Mark Levin, hello, good afternoon to you. You are the Chief Public Policy Counsel at the Council on Criminal Justice and a Senior Advisor to Write on Crime. So I just wanna invite you to do the same thing. Take about 60 to 90 seconds to tell us a little bit more about, about what you do and also your goals for today's conversation. Uh, it's great to be with you and also uh, in, virtually at the LBJ Library because um, some of you may know back in 1967, there was a report, a commission, the Katzenbach Commission that LBJ uh, convened that had more than 200 recommendations that are still uh, very timely in many ways. Of course, it led to landmark uh, improvements, including uh, establishing the 911 system, uh, better training for law enforcement, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and so forth. But it also dealt with conditions uh, that were, uh, you know, it found to be um, subpar, uh, to say the least, for juveniles uh, incarcerated around the country. And we still very much struggle with that here in Texas and beyond. So it, it was a very prescient uh, report and one that did lead to some significant changes. Um, so, uh, but uh, I've been working on criminal criminal justice reform uh starting here in Texas back in 2005 and um over that time we've uh, seen uh significant reductions in crime and incarceration obviously as we all know uh, there's been an uptick in the last couple of years in homicides and certain other types of violent crime but still overall crime is is far lower and of course Texas uh now has about 118,000 people in prison versus a high of 160,000 when the state also had uh, fewer people so our incarceration rate here in Texas is down by more than 40 percent uh but I uh started the criminal justice program at the Texas Public Policy Foundation back in 2005 and then the right on crime initiative in 2010 and then last year, I joined the Council on Criminal Justice as Chief Policy Counsel. And what we're really, uh, what we really do is provide a center of gravity in the criminal justice policy space. We um, compile a lot of data on crime rates, on how the pandemic uh, impacted domestic violence, and most importantly, I think we convene uh, a wide range of uh, experts, including through our policing task force, law enforcement leaders, um, civil rights advocates, and so forth, to come to the kind of consensus. Hopefully, we'll be talking about today. Really looking at the research research about what the data shows, what works in policing, what works in crime prevention, um, and on down the line. So uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be part of this discussion with uh, such a distinguished panel. Mark, thank you so much. Now over to veteran Austin police officer and assistant chief Jerry Balzon. Good afternoon to you. Hi, good afternoon, Tony. And uh, thank you all for having me. Um, on this panel, again, it's uh, it's an honor and it's uh, a pleasure to get to, again, participate in a conversation this meaningful with so many uh, uh, members that are experts in their field and have such uh, varied opinions. Again, my name is Jerry Bazan. I get to be one of the police chiefs or assistant police chiefs here at the Austin Police Department. I've been here going on 29 years now, so I've seen a lot of changes in the city of Austin and especially um, a lot of changes within this police department. Currently, I serve over the investigations bureau. So um, I am the chief over all investigations here within the city. And um, I also oversee our organized crime division. Um, I just wanna say that this is one of many steps on our journey uh, to collaborate with the community, right? My hope today is to dispel any misinformation that anyone may have about the police department and also just kind of uh, fill the gaps and help answer any questions that the community may have uh, when it comes to public safety and our role as a police department um, with the police or with the public safety in the city. Chief, thank you so much. Uh, obviously this panel was conceptualized and put together um, before developments that we've seen in our community over the past seven days with the announcement of indictments of 17 Austin police officers uh, stemming from the May 2020 protest. Certainly uh, the efforts to uh, reform criminal justice uh, an offshoot of that, uh, it, uh, according to many reformers and activists you talk to, is certainly police accountability. So I just want to spend uh, a couple of minutes, if we can, because this is such a monumental 
uh, event that has happened in our community, Austin and Travis County, now having the most indictments of police officers stemming from the May 2020 protest of any city in the country that I could find at least. So I wanna start with you, Chris, uh, on a path toward criminal justice reform and, and police accountability, what is your reaction to, to these 19 indictments? And do you think that that is part of, part of the process uh, that we're on in our community here? Sure, well, you know, so <laughs> um, I think, you know, my honest initial reaction was, was, was relief. Um, you know, what, how, how police accountability, you know, ultimately works in the city of Austin is that we have a city manager who oversees the department and the Office of Police Oversight. And we have the chief who's ultimately in charge of, of enacting any discipline. And, and what we've seen is that despite the fact that the city has seen fit to pay out millions of dollars in, in civil rights settlements to victims of police brutality during the protests, they have not seen fit, particularly those two individuals, to hold any of the officers who committed those violations directly accountable for it. And because of that, um, really the last stop, the only other place where accountability could possibly be seen, if not on the job from, from the department, from the city, is through the courts. Now, many of us have a lot of issues with the criminal legal system and don't see prison as the, uh, the way that we should prioritize uh, how we respond to harm. And so it's not a, a thing that we celebrate uh, anyone being indicted or, or potentially going to prison. That said, we also know that police have extraordinary powers in our society, more than in any individual. Training in weaponry, equipment with weaponry, and the authorization to use violence in the in in the uh, you know undertaking of their duties, and therefore it is extremely important that when they misuse those extraordinary powers, that there is some layer of accountability that happens. And again, because that has not happened at the city level. This was the last stop. And so, again, relief is is our response, or at least my response, as it relates to, to these indictments. Mark, over to you. Your reaction to the major national news happening in Austin over the past week? Yeah, no, this is a, a very challenging uh, a matter and one that obviously all the facts will have to be uh, reviewed uh, once, uh, if in fact these cases go to trial. Um, but I think certainly it spotlights the need for better training uh, for law enforcement, which is something we focused on, de-escalation training in particular. The evidence is very strong when it comes to that. And uh, I also think uh, it raises the issue of civil liability. And, um, you know, it could be a very ironic situation if, in fact, officers were criminally liable liable, but not civilly liable because of qualified immunity. And I think in general, the obviously the criminal law should be reserved for the most serious, um, uh, you know, and, and particularly intentional uh, violations. Now, the officers, I know many of them, or perhaps all of them in this uh, case, they, uh, they assert that they were following the policy uh, in terms of rubber bullets and so forth, that they were following orders, actually specific instructions. And so that actually you know, in the area of qualified immunity, which again is a civil question, um, typically would be a, a, a defense that they um, that they followed, um, you know, policy or a, 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 a decisions of a court uh, a, 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 that was on all fours with the current situation um, and therefore could claim qualified immunity. Now, the, the problem with qualified immunity is it's, it's really uh, made it very difficult for people who have legitimate claims to get damages, which typically would be from the agency itself uh, more than 95 percent of officers in civil suits are indemnified. So there are obviously real concerns about retention and recruiting for police these days. But I think, for example, Colorado adopted a, a qualified immunity reform and has not seen uh, any blowback in terms of uh, more officers harder to staff than any other staffing challenges across the country. So um, and that law, of course, uh, very much limits what the officer could pay to a very small amount if they even paid anything. And again, the um, it's kind of like if an Amazon uh, driver uh, injures you, then you go after Amazon and you collect uh, from them. Um, so it's the same uh, situation here. So uh, I would finally say, therefore, that, that the primary focus that we really ought to have in terms of where most account accountability in most cases, all but the most serious cases, it's going to need to uh, lie in the area of decertification. And there was actually some really good legislation that was uh, unfortunately didn't quite make it last session here in Texas from uh, two conservative 
conservative Republicans, Steve Toth, James White, both friends of mine, but it would have really put some teeth in the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. Right now, you actually have to have two convicted crimes before an officer would be decertified. So it's an extremely high bar. And uh, that legislation would really um, help because, again, the majority of cases, you're not going to see a criminal prosecution. And the question is, I think the vast majority of officers do a good job, but a small number of officers who, you know, obviously like Derek Chauvin, who had 18 uh, complaints, um, uh, many substantiated that they do give the profession a bad name. And there's some people who just aren't cut out to be a police officer. If you have a hairpin trigger for your temper or whatever, you go into another field and do fine. And so that's why the small number of officers who are responsible for a disproportionate share of, of uh, valid, verified misconduct, we need a better procedure for uh, being able to decertify them and other departments to see that that person was decertified for misconduct. Chief, this is literally happening in your office. And obviously, in recent days, we've heard from your boss, Police Chief Joe Chacon, uh, largely defending uh, the police officers who have been indicted, saying that based on his review and, and the review of, of executives, the brass of APD, they found no um, criminal violations in their assessment. So uh, certainly, I recognize that, that you all are still um, in the midst of some administrative processes as well as, as a number of civil suits still facing the city. But, but I do think it's important that we hear from, from you on this topic as well. Absolutely, Tony. And I would uh, be lying if I were to say that I wasn't ex expecting this question uh, to come up today, especially in light of the recent events. Um, and I do recognize, I appreciate your question, and I do recognize there are a lot of questions out there surrounding the recent indictments. And I want to correct you, there were 19 of our officers um, that were indicted um, last week. Um, Did I say the wrong number? Pardon me. <laughs> I think you opened with 17. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, 17. 19. Yes. Yeah, yes. pardon yes. me. So other than to say that I do respect the judicial process, you know, I want everyone to remember that our officers are innocent until proven guilty in that court of law. And as uh, uh, Mark said, I don't know if they'll ever make it to trial, but we have to remember that um, because right now I think they're being tried um, in the public eye right now. And I want to give those officers a, a, a fair shake. Um, with that being said, I do believe in police accountability. I know there's a lot of conversation out there that police and law enforcement in generally don't hold our own accountable. In the 29 years that I've been here with the Austin Police Department, I've done my time as an internal affairs investigator, as well as uh, being the commander overseeing our professional standards uh, division, which includes internal affairs. So I've seen the process. I've been um, involved in those investigations. I've been in conversations with executive, executives, even as I was at a lower rank. And I want to assure everyone that's listening on this call we do hold ourselves accountable, more so than I would say other police departments um, across the country. So I don't want anyone to think that just because we defend our officers, as officers doesn't mean that uh, we are not holding ourselves accountable. Uh, the conversation and topic of training came up. Uh, as you all know, and again, in the last uh, several, during the last several months, the Austin Police Department's Training Academy has been under a watchful eye of a, a third party. And uh, they just released their report a week or so ago um, talking about um, our training. We are working on improving our training. Um, I still believe that we have one of the most robust training uh, departments in the country of any law enforcement agency. I'm proud of what we do and how we train. Obviously there are things that can be done better and those are things that are being shown to us that are being highlighted that we are working to, um, to amend. So other than that, since these indictments are so new and we are so early in the process, I don't think that I've got much more to add uh, to this discussion at this time. And certainly, I, I know that we could spend a lot of time on, on the, the protest and the aftermath, but I do want to broaden our conversation as well. The topic is really about building consensus with regard to criminal justice reform. And it just seems like more and more that, that the divide is growing instead of diminishing. So, Mark, I'll start with you on this question. I mean, 
is a consensus really possible in your estimation at this point? And if so, what, what does that look like? Sure. Well, I think it is. Um, and um, first of all, uh, public safety is the most core responsibility of government. I think we can all agree on that. And, and it's kind of, you know, your right stop where my nose begins kind of thing that um, regardless of whether you're a liberal or conservative, that um, the government uh, needs to intervene if somebody harms someone else and better yet prevent that harm from occurring to begin with. Um, and so uh, we also, I think all of us across the spectrum want, uh, you know, people to uh, be able to reintegrate if they are incarcerated in, in terms of employment, in terms of family. Uh, and everyone can also agree that um, victims should be compensated through restitution or otherwise. Um, and so you go down the line, and of course, we'd all like to do this with the least expenditure of resources possible, um, but recognizing that, you um, it does take money. Uh, a lot of the, uh, whether you're talking about police training, for example, um, or you're talking about pretrial justice to make sure um, uh, someone comes back to court in terms of text reminders or mental health or drug treatment. Um, you know, over the last um, year, uh, there's been 100,000 deaths from drug overdoses. So that's, Chris talked earlier about a broad conception of public safety, and that that's very much on target. Um, and I mean, who's for fatal drug overdoses? Who's for violent crime? Um, now, I think the, the question, and I think it's, by the way, it's a lot easier to agree on the front end in terms of crime prevention strategies. And we are starting to see some results. For example, in Dallas, uh, violent crime has, has declined 11% um, since they've implemented kind of a all of the above um, solution. And it's very targeted to people and places kind of using a grid system. And they've used violence interrupters. They've used surging law enforcement. They've also gotten rid of dilapidated buildings, abandoned buildings, put in street lights. Um, so they've taken kind of a, a, a whole um, comprehensive approach and specifically focused on the areas that have the most violent crime. And that's, that's really can be as concentrated as a certain street corner. Um, and it's not, you know, to go round people up or stop and frisk or anything like that. Uh, but it's also recognizing the role of services, um, including, you know, after school programs for youths, right? Because we know during the pandemic, a lot of young people uh, never re-engaged with school. There's a couple of million kids unaccounted for uh, that didn't come back to our public schools and, and in many cases didn't go to private school or homeschooling. So we're, we've are we seen this huge decline in juvenile delinquency over the last few decades. Um, our juvenile incarceration nationally went down by more than half and, and even greater decline in Texas. But the concern is if we don't re-engage these young people in positive activities, we're going to see, for example, carjackings, which is largely uh, 17, 18, even younger, 15, 16, uh, that, that we, we hear about now. So I think that... Um, all of these things, and, and again, the agreement is so much easier on the front end to prevent crime, whether through police presence. Uh, I just saw police on horses here in Houston after there's some of reports of um, uh, assaults on jogging trails. So that's the kind of visibility that uh, we see uh, that can be beneficial in deterring crime, but also these non-police responses. I mean, police are the first people to say we need, for example, people with mental illness and other uh, place besides the jail where they can go. Um, and um, so they recognize, I believe, I don't want to speak for all law enforcement, that they're one tool in the toolbox. And so I, I, I just uh, continue to be optimistic. I know this issue was often used to score political points, um, but, I, but I really believe when you get down to it, we all want a safer society, a freer society, and we, you know, we don't want to um, uh, be taxed more than necessary to accomplish that. Chris, in your so, estimation, in your estimation, can a consensus really be reached in terms of what appropriate law enforcement and an appropriate criminal justice system looks like? Uh, I'm a, I, I wish I shared Mark's optimism because I do appreciate it. <laughs> um, you know, I think, um, you know, for people like myself and, and others that that work on criminal justice issues, um, either entirely or in part uh, as a profession um, those that those that I respect um, we we want to make ourselves obsolete um, we don't want to have to do this work <laughs> we don't want uh, to, this to be a, a lifelong thing this is very difficult work and, and hard work um, unfortunately uh, what we see on the other side are our interests who who are very much, uh, committed to preserving the status quo and don't want and don't and don't see 
uh, the situation in a similar way. In particular, when we talk about um, police, um, prison guard, and, and other uh, 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 associations that represent uh, those those individuals, um, you know, their entire you know agenda is to um, is to grow both their own organizational power uh, and dollars, uh, which means more members, which means more dues paying members, means more political power for them, and and ultimately to increase the the actual on the ground authority of their members as it relates to how they can treat members of the public. Um, I, I see no um, change in how those organizations uh, function or or approach these issues, and. Because of the power that they possess, um, both within the political structure and, and their ability to to get earn earn media, earn press, frankly, um, um, you know, I think it's going to be very very difficult to find a consensus as long as as those organizations hold sway uh, in our public policy debates. Um, and and I and I want to be clear here because I am talking about not necessarily the you know, every single person who works in these or for these organizations, not talking about the actual departments themselves in many cases. I'm talking about these associations that represent uh, many of their members. And so um, because of their sway uh, and power uh, within the current political and media sphere, um, I, I don't see um, um, consensus is very likely, uh, especially because of you know their willingness to to utilize fear uh, as a tactic, as a as a motivating tool. Uh, Mark mentioned you know how public safety is often used to score political points, and I think um, you know these are the entities that are are most often trying to to point out the score. Um, and and so uh, until or unless we're able to to reduce or minimize the power that these organizations. Uh, have, um, then I, I'm not sure that we can reach a consensus. Chief, certainly the police play a big role in, in whether or not a consensus is reached or not. Um, your, you know, your officers are on the ground. They're the ones who are having that frontline contact with, with citizens. Um, how do you really see the police um, being a positive force in, in that conversation? Sure. So, you know, I like to think of myself as an, op as an optimist, right? So I do hope that we can work to consensus when it comes to public safety and law enforcement. We pride ourselves here at the Austin Police Department as being a department who engages and reaches out to our community. Uh, community engagement, community policing is not just something we say that we do. It's something that we try to interweave into every fabric um, of our department when it comes to call takers at 911, when it co uh, comes to the officers who respond to the uh, 911 calls, when it comes to victim services, uh, detectives, investigators, all the way up. We remind our employees that every contact made with a citizen is an opportunity to build that relationship. So that is something if that if that culture hadn't already been um, isn't already uh, um, accepted or lived out throughout our department, that's something that we're working on. And I, you know, again, I've been here for almost 30 years and I learned about that from the day one of my academy time. So I'm hoping and I've seen it um, throughout the uh, department and I've seen officers and um, our civilian staff uh, live that out. Now, that being said, I also understand that there are things that we have to do to build that community trust. One of those things is doing exactly what I'm doing now and what we as executive staff are doing when we go out to our these community meetings is we want to give the community a voice. We want to, we want to listen to what they have to say because that's important to us. Again, um, we would be blind if we uh, thought that we are the only ones who can make policy and we knew what was best and how to best serve our, our communities. So one, we wanna give the communities a voice and we wanna be able to listen to them. Part of that listening is also being respectful to the different voices. We may not have to agree with everything that's being said, but we, again, need to be respectful because, again, part of that consensus is how do we work together? How do we partner in uh, 
how do we partner together in making those things uh, work together, our points of view and other points of view, right? Because we all understand that there are more sides uh, than the one side of the story that we're always hearing, especially um, with social media playing such a huge role in what's communicated. Nowadays, it's hard for officers and the general public to, to you know, uh, discern truth uh, from fiction. Um, and again, part of that building consensus is again, just building uh, that trustworthiness. We wanna be trusted by everyone out there. It doesn't do us any good for our officers to show up with our APD badge and patch in our patrol cars if the community and our public is not gonna trust them. So we have to build that communication, that transparency and that trust in order for that consensus to be achieved. Chief, thank you. I wanna spend some time also talking about uh, an issue that Nathan raised in his introduction. And that is, the lack of relationship or the relationship, depending on how you see the world, um, between uh, the number of police officers Austin has with a murder, uh, a number of murders that was in fact historic in 2021. Um, certainly, if you if you are are. Uh, uh, someone who, who views the role of police as, as combating crime, you automatically correlate number of officers on the street to, to less crime. Reformers see that conversation as much more complicated and nuanced and, and a lack of, of direct relationship. So Chris, you and I have certainly talked about this over time as well, um, but, but I'm wondering if you can more fully uh, explain your position and the position of, of many reformers with regard to safety versus number of officers. Sure. Um, well, yeah, it is, it is really complicated, but I'll, I'll try to do what I can here in a short response. So, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously there are many different types of uh, criminalized behaviors, things that we, we deem crimes. And some of those crimes are are actually related to harm uh, and people being harmed, and and some of those crimes are not. And so when we talk, when we use an, uh, an overarching term like crime, firstly, I think we 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 drop the ball a little bit because um, we we might be talking about very minor things, victimless things that you know our legislature and its wisdom has chosen to criminalize, but is not actually <laughs> a problem in our society that's causing harm to, to anyone necessarily. So I wanna start there. Secondarily, when we talk about obviously the most severe type of crime, we talk about uh, the loss of life, murder. Um, you know, I think the picture as it relates to how police can play a role is very complex. And it's not necessarily that more police will mean reduced murders. We can see that in the number of officers, as well as the ratio of officers to population uh, around the country. Uh, we have cities that have high, higher end officer to population ratios that have very high murder rates uh, versus cities that have lower uh, officer to population ratios that have much lower murder rates. There's not a correlation between these two numbers. And when you look really specifically at uh, the incidents uh, themselves, you start to get a picture of why. The Austin Chronicle, for instance, looked at 10 years of murders uh, in an article last year. What they found was that two thirds of them were between people that knew each other. The plurality of those in private spaces, places where the police will are not able to access. Now, are there instances maybe where some previous police interaction could have gone differently and prevented it? Perhaps, but what we're often talking about with murder is something that happens between two people that know each other in private. And so what we're talking about in terms of how do we prevent this is not a police centered conversation. It's about other things. And, you know, I think when we look at how COVID, uh, how the, the increase in murders has corresponded with the onset of the pandemic, I think this gives us a better picture, right? So um, when we talk about underserved communities, communities where more people live in precarity without healthcare access, without access to capital, without access to, to the better schools and, and education. Uh, we often see that those are the areas that also have higher rates of interpersonal violence. And what we've seen with COVID 
is an expansion of that precarity beyond even those traditional neighborhoods. And it, of course, exacerbated in those underserved and underinvested in communities. And, and so with that rise in precarity, a loss of social cohesion, a rise in antisocial behavior, uh, these are the things that <laughs> we believe are contributing as much or more to what we're seeing right now uh, than anything to do with policing. And I think that's the difficult part for many people to do is to really decouple the notion that uh, you know, loss of life, loss of uh, uh, the, the interpersonal violence or harm uh, can be directly solved or prevented by um, additional officers. And, I, and, I, and that's where you know, we, we're really looking at how can we look at more broad interventions, um, firstly on the front end to help prevent that precarity, help prevent uh, th those, those situations that lead to the loss of social cohesion, lead to uh, 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 you know, these more dangerous behaviors lead to reliance on markets that are criminalized? Um, and, and how can we then also, when we do have an emergency that arises, respond with the best person possible who can meet the needs of those people who are in that emergency? And unfortunately, because of our historical overinvestment in policing, we've, we've, we really don't have uh, the people that we need to respond to a lot of those varied uh, types of emergencies that arise. And so, you know, for us, it's really about trying to find out how we can make those investments in the preventative measures, in reducing a precarity in our communities, and in the best types of responses for each type of emergency that people in our community face. Chris, one point that, that you did not mention just then, though I've certainly heard you mention it before, and Chief, I've, I've heard uh, the police themselves talk about this as a, as a major um, contributor, particularly to the number of murders that Austin, Austin saw last year, and that is the prol proliferation of guns. So can you just spend a couple of minutes talking about that as well, the, the number of guns on our streets? Absolutely. So, yes, uh, last year we did see a record number of uh, homicides here in the city of Austin. And starting off uh, this brand new 2022 year, uh, January, we saw one of the highest murder rates that our city's ever seen in a one month period, um, in, especially in the January period following last year's homicide rates. Also, and I, I, I don't have the numbers with me, but yes, last uh, year, more of our homicides occurred uh, with the use of um, guns and any other uh, time that, that we can remember. A lot of that has to do with the number of illegal guns that are out on the street. As a matter of fact, I'm not gonna steal Chief Chuck Owens thunder, but here in the next week or two, he's going to do a public uh, press release or a, press, a presser uh, talking about our stance against um, illegal guns here um, and what we're gonna do to keep Austin safe with the upcoming South by Southwest, uh, which is just a couple of weeks away. So in regards to the guns, there are a lot of illegal guns out there. And this is where the number of police officers uh, directly correlates with, with those illegal guns is when we have less officers responding to 911 calls, and let's, let's face it, a lot of people paint us as crime fighters. First and foremost, oh, we, we are public servants. So our vast resources uh, that we are asking for are to meet the response of our community, the 911 calls. Uh, as a citizen here in Austin, when you call 911 and there's an emergency, you expect to have uh, a response from a law enforcement agency. So by reducing the number of um, officers on patrol, it, uh, it keeps us from, uh, the, it keeps, uh, reduces our abilities to responding um, as we should. A lot of that also has to do with um, our specialized units as well. So again, I'm over organized crime and we have uh, certain uh, units in those details that uh, focus on gun violence and getting those illegal guns off the street. Having to reallocate our resources from certain units and put them back on patrol, uh, again, takes away from our resource in combating gun crime. So um, those guns are out there um, and there is very little we can do as a law enforcement agency with, our, uh, with the limited number of resources that we currently have. So we've got about 17 minutes left. I just wanna tell our viewers, if you've got questions, now is the time to, to put them in the chat. We'll be posing them 
to our our panelists. Mark, I do want to ask you where is where is your truth in this conversation and with regard to number of police officers and the relationship or or lack thereof of on crime on the street? Yeah, no, it's a great question, and I think zooming out is helpful. We are in terms of uh, police officers per capita, we have fewer than France and Italy and Mexico. Um, you know, so of course, in terms of uh, incarceration, where, as everyone knows, the, the world leader, five uh, percent of the world's population, twenty percent of the world's prisoners, so we're, But, but in terms of police per capita, we're actually maybe middle of the pack. So, uh, and then in terms of cities, you know, Chicago and Baltimore have more than twice the police per capita of Austin or Tucson, but they're different situations, and and they have a higher level of uh, violent crime to deal with. Um, but uh, I think it really the focus is also on what what should police be doing, and of course. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of um, positive changes in terms of either co-responding or alternative responders in certain types of issues in terms of drug possession, mental health cases, somebody's yelling at the top of their lungs at McDonald's. Uh, now, you can always always have the officer as the backup, um, but also noise complaints, um, certain traffic matters, there are jurisdictions that are experimenting with other uh, alternatives to police. Um, but I think also, you know, the numbers aren't just about solving crime, it's about response time, as was stated earlier, um, the ability to to engage communities uh, at meetings and develop relationships and training. If you, uh, you don't have uh, enough officers, then you're not going to be able to allocate officers not to be on duty and, and to be in training. And then finally, sending uh, there's certain cases where I think sending two officers instead of one with somebody who, uh, who may be volatile, you're able to reduce the risk of either force or even excessive force being used. And, and then finally, on the building trust thing, I think this really kind of brings us all together in terms of understanding that, you know, the community... Uh, being able to provide information on homicides and other serious crimes to, to officers, the willingness of witnesses and victims to cooperate. That's the partnership that's critical to solving crimes and, and, and hopefully even preventing them through violence interrupters, for example. Um, and, you know, I do think, I do agree with Chris that um, some of the policies like civil asset forfeiture, um, the Sandra Bland bill, which, you know, has run into opposition in Texas from police unions, where we were trying to basically say you can't be uh, uh, arrested for fine only traffic violations like failure to signal or a broken taillight, that that, that with, unless there's some, you know, urgent public safety threat to the officer, that that I think that a lot of police are coming around to the idea. And I, you know, I even saw some banter on like the Facebook page for a cleat that basically some of the members, some of the actual officers actually thought the Sandra Bland bill was pretty reasonable and thought that the union by continuing to oppose it was reducing their influence. So I do think over time, and I know it can be slow, I do think a lot of officers have come to realize, and there are, by the way, other states like Illinois, where a forfeiture bill was agreed with, with the police organizations. So I do think over time, as you, um, uh, particularly as, of course, as you fund uh, law enforcement sufficiently through general resources, so they're not kind of an eat what you kill forfeiture mindset. And then, of course, you do explain that these policies in terms of arresting people for fine only traffic offenses, for example, they uh, erode that trust that really is in the interest of police officers and the community. We do have one question from from a viewer that I want to pose to the entire panel now. It says, what do you think of state legislative involvement in deciding local police policies outside lawmakers having a say in specific city police decisions? Um, certainly, we have seen that to an extent here in Austin and, and Texas. Um, Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, well, it's, I think it's a complex question because, you know, I think clearly the state has an interest in, in preserving the, the rights of its citizens and, and it, where it's seeing them infringe, expanding those rights. So uh, to the extent that we're talking about, um, you know, legislation aimed uh, at, at, at doing things like Mark is saying about um, you know, um, uh, you know, limiting some sort of enforcement activities because they're seen as ultimately counterproductive or, or harmful. Um, you know, those are things that I think, you know, at, at a at across the board level that the state should be looking at doing. When it comes to targeting specific cities, particularly as it relates to, you know, HB 1900 and, and saying, you know, how much that must spend on police or, or other types of services, um, I do think that's an overreach. And, and I think that, um, you know, ultimately, you know, 
those, those types of services that are paid for by city tax dollars <laughs> uh, should be allocated by locally elected officials. Uh, and that's, I, I think, you know, what ultimately our, you know, federalist system is set up to allow, uh, you know, tax dollars, you know, acquired by that local jurisdiction to be uh, largely spent by the elected officials of that jurisdiction. So, um, and I think on principle that makes sense. And then, you know, I think specifically as it relates to HB 1900, it's extremely short-sighted um, in that, again, I think it, it was a, obviously a knee jerk to what amounted to ultimately a, a 20 ish million dollar reduction in the Austin police budget, as well as the sort of moving of the forensics lab and the 911 call center uh, to separate departments, uh, not shrinking those departments, but simply moving them uh, to, to be operated uh, differently and by uh, different personnel. And, and, and what that money ultimately went to was things like increased uh, uh, community health paramedics. Um, that are you know helping people dealing with substance use, dealing with homelessness. Uh, it went to a domestic violence shelter. Uh, one of the best interventions to help folks that are dealing with domestic violence actually escape that and prevent harm. Um, it it went to you know parks and and other things that again help you know keep kids out of trouble and and provide these opportunities for people to do other things. So you know ultimately that twenty million dollars was invested in public safety just in different forms of it. And for them to then say that, you know, that necessitates preventing any reduction in police spending in any big city across the state in perpetuity, I think is extremely short-sighted and ultimately harms public safety because now uh, we won't be able to make those sort of reinvestment decisions in the future if we see that, um, that actually those dollars could be better spent on something that might actually prevent something uh, that police are responding to today. Mark, your answer to this question, what do you think the level of state legislative involvement should be in deciding local policing policies? Well, and it does have an analog in terms of the federal, you know, which, of course, the traditional federal is providing technical assistance, support. A number of jurisdictions have used uh, America Rescue Plan money for uh you know, different uh, crime prevention, uh, such as violence interrupters and so forth. Now, one of the questions is, you know, if you have a one-time funding source and you you implement that, then, and you don't have that grant the next year, your budget goes down, you, you could be portrayed as, quote, defunding the police, right? So it is, uh, these are complicated uh, matters, um, but I think that, um, you know, one of the, the bigger question really now is, recruiting and retention. I had a call from a city council member and um, you know, it was a mid-sized city and they're way short in terms of their officer staffing. And they never made, even thought of reducing funding for police, but it's just a matter of, um, of, of hiring and I think expanding the pool. I mean, only 11% of officers are women. So that's a key area, I think. And there is some evidence that actually having more women in policing um, does lead to better outcomes. So uh, I really think that we need to encourage more people to go into policing, um, even looking at some college programs uh, where, you know, a lot of people when they go to college don't know what they want to do. And wouldn't it be great if there was a uh, program there that could, whether it's community or four-year college, be an avenue towards getting into policing? Chief, can you pick up uh, that conversation? I'm curious if you can just discuss uh, the difficulty or not that APD specifically is having with regard to recruitment of new police officers and, and the degree to which the department is going to try to find uh, not just officers, but officers who would be a good fit for Austin as well. Yeah, absolutely. As Mark said, it's uh, the Austin Police Department. We're not siloed in a recruitment battle. Uh, I think law enforcement agencies across the entire country are having difficulty recruiting officers. And um, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because of what's happened uh, the last several years with uh, light on uh, law enforcement um, in general, or if there are um, other attributes uh, causing those issues. But we here at Austin Police Department, uh, we do have a recruiting department that is actively seeking qualified individuals first here within our local community, because again, we want to represent the community that we serve and who better to represent our own community than our own community, right? So we're first hiring within our community and we're also outreaching. We're going to, uh, you know, to uh, other cities, other states where we feel um, 
uh, qualified candidates are that may not want to serve or, uh, you know, uh, be officers in their states or their cities for whatever reason that is. We're trying to make the Austin Police Department as desirable as possible. And I think, you know, we're, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, and going back to uh, the defunding that uh, Chris was talking about, yes, a lot of that money was, you know, in, you know, came with the, our forensics uh, department and uh, our communications. But part of that money, I think that affects us here at the police department more so than everything was the cancellation of the classes, right? And I understand why those uh, cadet classes were paused because there was a question as to what type of training were we uh, providing to our recruits? So, you know, again, for better or for worse, we can always make, we can always improve. So we looked at the curriculum, we're improving that curriculum. Now I think it's time to move forward with that. We've got just about seven minutes left here, but Chris, I, I wanted to ask you just on that topic, um, when you hear uh, police officials, including Chief Bazan, say that, that APD is having difficulty recruiting officers, what, what is your response to that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I really don't have one. I mean, I don't, I, that's not an area that I'm uh, really focused on is, you know, police retention and attrition and, and things like that. I think, um, you know, I think when we look across, you know, uh, society right now, we see, um, we see many industries um, s making similar claims about being unable to find staff. I think this might very well just be a product of, uh, of obviously changes in the economy due to the pandemic. Um, some people staying home with children uh, that have left the workforce. Um, some people that have, uh, you know, decided to pursue different careers. They realize life is short. <laughs> and, and, and then, uh, you know, I think the elephant here is over a million people dead in our, in our country and over 1300 just here in Travis County. And, you know, these deaths reverberate in ways we, 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 we don't even understand and, and won't for, for a long time. And so, again, for us, it's, you know, how do we really look at how we can prevent all sorts of preventable things? Because, you know, while obviously what um, many of the things that police are responding to today um, are serious and are important uh, and, and, and require intervention um, and you know, the, the deaths from interpersonal violence or the harm from interpersonal violence that occurs in our community is, is no more of a tragedy than, than a preventable death from, from cancer or heart disease or COVID or the flu or overdose or any of those things. And, and for us, we, we want to see us put our dollars towards preventing those things that are, are again, causing and leading to uh, the most preventable harm uh, disability and, and death in our communities. So Chris, you, you sort of uh, answered this, uh, but I want to ask all of our panelists as well. Chris, you gave us a kind of a, a foreshadow of how I think you may answer this question. Um, uh, but in the few minutes we have remaining here, I just want to ask each of you, and, and Mark, I'll, I can start with you, but as you look to the future, the coming months, the coming year, what is your goal around, around this topic, around uh, consensus, not only consensus, but reform as well? Sure, and, and picking up on what we were just talking about, I think officer wellness programs, we evaluated a number of those with the, at the Council on Criminal Justice and found that those can be really helpful in retaining officers, uh, which is obviously the other side of the coin from recruiting. Um, and exposure to violence, whether it leads to PTSD or other trauma, that really actually is something that unites both officers and people who have been incarcerated, for example, uh, and, and exposed to it in those settings, and also people that have just been exposed to violence on the street or domestic violence. Um, so that's really where I think the we can find these commonalities. Um, and, you know, um, certainly we, uh, here in Houston, where I am, I mean, the first 10 minutes on the local news, you probably all heard the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, you don't report, obviously, on the planes that land safely. And, and that's that's understandable, right? The media has a duty to inform the public about crime. But I also think, you know, people look on next door, right? And somebody heard of what they thought was a gunshot, and then it turns out it wasn't. So there's a lot of um, noise out there. Um, and um, people have to 
kind of like with COVID, right? You have to make uh, be able to make uh, hopefully objective determinations about what what risks in life there are and how best to protect yourself. I think the, um, but I really do think that the communities that uh, where violent crime is is the most pernicious problem, they do want policing it, perhaps a little bit different kind of policing than we've seen traditionally. And so um, in my view, there is this opportunity to come together uh, and really um, fund those things that work. And that's why an evaluation component is so effective to, to identify those, those uh, practices like focused deterrence, for example, has had, had, had very good outcomes. Uh, violence interruption, especially when you tend to the professional development and wellness and, and uh, of the violence interrupters. And then you kind of do this whole menu of strategies like Dallas is doing on certain, uh, focused on certain people and places, because that's, that's really where you get the most bang for your buck. Um, and combining it with the environmental uh, issues in terms of whether it's street lights, abandoned buildings, um, providing recreation centers for young people after school and so forth. So it's it's really all hands on deck. And that's why I'm optimistic we can find consensus. Chief, as you personally look to the future from, from where you sit, but also from the perspective of the Austin Police Department, what will be the department's goals and your personal goal for that matter in, in the months and year to come? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I just want to say this, you know, a vast majority of uh, people, of men and women that come into the law enforcement pro pro law enforcement profession uh, want to do the right thing, right? And what policing looked like when I first joined almost 30 years ago and what it looks like now are completely different. And I think moving forward in another 30 years, policing will look again completely different than it does today. And I think it's progressing uh, towards the better because what we just because we did things a certain way in the past doesn't necessarily make it the best way. So again, what my hope is is that we can be a department who listens. So as we serve our community, we can take the input, give them the voice, so that we can become the police department and offer the services that our community expects from us. Chris, and to you, certainly, I know that that. Uh you and the Austin Justice Coalition have, have made this a huge priority in, in, in the days ahead as well. Sure, and I think for our part, you know, we're, we're looking to, you know, uh, as it relates specifically to these issues and issues of interpersonal violence, um, you know, made some considerable investments in, in how we can expand uh, access to conflict resolution uh, outside of the criminal legal system. Um, uh, services as well as restorative justice personnel uh, to to resolve and restore after harm has occurred, um, and, and I think we hope to continue to 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 expand those efforts in our communities to to try to see harm again prevented where possible and and where not restored in in ways that hopefully don't involve uh, people having to go to prison and and uh, and and punishment being the central response. And I think, again, on, you know, to the whole, I think what, what we really want to see is, is investment of our public dollars in uh, the things that are causing the most, uh, again, preventable uh, harm, disability, and, and death in our communities. And, and by and large, again, where we see that is in the areas of public health. And so, uh, and we believe that, um, you know, the lack of access to public health and healthcare and, and general precarity within many of our communities uh, is what uh, is causing or does cause uh, more interpersonal violence. And so if we actually do put our dollars towards preventing these other forms of harm, uh, we, can, we can also prevent a lot of the interpersonal violence that uh, we rely on police to respond to today. So I think, you know, that those are really, um, you know, central to, to our goals as we move forward with this. And, um, and, and again, just, I think, but, but I do think to Mark's original point, I think we all, <laughs> we all want a safer communities. We all want communities where we where we feel safe and where we are safe and, and, you know, ultimately where we also have uh, most freedom that we're able to have uh, and don't feel as though, you know, our rights are infringed or uh, th under threat. So there's a point of consensus that, that we can all work from. Thank you all so much. It's one o'clock on the money. So uh, thanks thanks again for, for joining us. And I'm going to kick it back over to Nathan for a couple of closing remarks. Thanks again.
Absolutely. Tony, thank you for moderating today. Uh, Chief, Chris, Mark, thank you for sharing your time and insights with us. Uh, these conversations are value for the health of our city and citizens and our civic health as a country. So thank you all. Thank you to each of you who've spent your lunchtime with us uh, for taking part in the, uh, with, with us today. If you're not yet a member of the Future Forum, I would encourage you to sign up on our website, lbjfutureforum.org. Members enjoy first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Presidential Library. Coming up next, we'll take a look at the changing demographics and political trends in the Rio Grande Valley. And uh, also save the date for our annual Easter egg roll, which is back this year. We haven't had it for the last two. That'll be on uh, Saturday, April 16th at 10.30 a.m. More details will be shared and posted to lbjfutureforum.org soon, as well as on all of our social channels. You can follow us at uh, LBJ Future Forum, at LBJ Future Forum. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope to see you all again or see you around town. Thanks for joining. <laughs>